Uh, hello and welcome to CMC. I'm Kermit Whitfield, a member of the CMC's Board of Trustees and Director of Communications for United Way of Central Ohio. Uh, it's great to see everyone here today. Today, the Columbus Metropolitan Club presents J.D. Vance on Poverty, sponsored by the Columbus Foundation, Fordham Institute, Deloitte, Porter Wright, Dispatch Media Group, The Jeffrey Company, and in partnership with Columbus Metropolitan Library. Each of them are represented by many of their friends and associates. Let's take a moment to thank them all and welcome Chad Aldis of Thomas B. Fordham Institute to introduce our forum. Thank you, Kermit. I'm Chad Aldis of the Thomas B. Fordham Institute. Fordham is proud to support the mission of the Columbus Metropolitan Club e to convene each week topics and speakers of importance to the community. I'm especially pleased, looking out over the crowd today, I've never had, I don't think, as many people sign up to hear me give an introduction. So <laughs> that's fantastic. Um, seriously, though, we are especially pleased to support today's conversation around poverty. As an organization focused on improving educational outcomes for all students, we are deeply aware of both the challenges that poverty presents and the role that education can play in escaping it. Of course, poverty, like most long-term uh, problems, doesn't lend itself to simple solutions. That's why forum like, forums like today's are so important to ensure a wide range of opinions and ideas are considered. We are honored to host three impressive individuals who, in very different ways, address these issues daily. Will please welcome New York Times best-selling author and scholar in residence at the OSU Department of Political Science, J.D. Vance, the director of the Ohio Department. Well, you'll get a second, just just a second. The director of the Ohio Department of Jobs and Family Services, Cynthia Dungey, and journalist at the Ohio State House News Bureau, Andy Chow. J.D. is going to start us off with a few short opening remarks. Then Andy will lead our conversation. J.D., the podium is yours. Well, thank you. Thanks to the Columbus Metropolitan Club for, for hosting today, and, and thanks for inviting me. It's, it's good to be here. I've actually never been to this building, despite living maybe 10 minutes away from here. Um, I, I, I should tell you that uh, this birthday is a very rude awakening into adulthood for me, not just because I have an eight-week-old baby, but also because I'm going to the dentist later today. <laughs> if there's an, uh, I, don't, I can't think of any way to think you're an adult now, then you have to go to the dentist on your birthday. So. <laughs> So I, I appreciated you guys bringing some festivity to the occasion and, and singing for me. So uh, I'll, I'll remember that fondly as I'm getting uh, drilled into my, my teeth later this afternoon. But I, I've been asked to just frame the conversation very briefly, and I'll try to, to, to only take up just a few minutes because I know that uh, ho hopefully there's going to be an interesting conversation, and I'm more excited about that than about just standing up here and talking at you. But I, I did think that it would be useful to give just a, a broad insight in, into how I try to think about these issues, because I, I do think that in some ways we have a conversation on poverty that's driven by very much by our political dialogue. And because our political dialogue is so fractured and in some ways even tribalistic, I don't think that we come to this qu question and conversation on poverty with quite the nuance that we need to have. Because when I listen to folks, for example, on the right talk about poverty, then you know, very often it's, it's a conversation about personal responsibility and individual failure. If I listen to folks on the left talk about poverty, it's very often a conversation about lack of economic opportunities and structural inequality, underfunded public schools, not enough job opportunities, and so forth. And I, and I think that both of those separate political ideologies have something really important to bring to the conversation. It is definitely the case that if you look at poor families from the outside, sometimes folks aren't always making the best decisions. It is very true that if you look at some of the job opportunities that are available to some people, they're not quite as equal as we all might like them to be. But I also think that there's something really important that's missing in this conversation, and it's all of the things that exist in between individuals making personal choices and governments and economic systems providing opportunities. And what I, what I mean is that there are individual families, and of course we know that families are one of the big drivers of whether people have much in the way of opportunity, one of the big drivers, one of the big predictors of whether a kid who grows up in a low-income family will be able to achieve the American dream is whether they grow up in a neighborhood with a lot of two-parent families. So we have to appreciate and understand that the stability of the two-parent family is something that's driving some of these uh, some of the, frankly, negative social trends that we see, because they, they are negative. If you look at some of the areas that 
those of us in this room are most concerned about, southwestern Ohio, central Ohio, southeastern Ohio, what we see is that children who grow up on the bottom of the economic ladder very often tend to stay there. They don't climb quite as frequently or quite as often as people do in other parts of the country. And I, I think that should really worry us. I think that should really animate how we think about this problem, that this isn't a problem that is broadly spread across the entire country. Of course, there are problems of poverty in Utah and San Francisco, just as there are in Central Ohio. But the problem of people who are born poor, staying poor, is a unique problem to some of the areas of the country that we find ourselves in. And I, and I think that that should animate this conversation. So when we talk about individual responsibility or structural inequality, I think we ignore, like I said before, the family, but we ignore other things at, at the same time. We ignore, for example, the role of social capital and the way that the social networks that people develop really influence and impact whether they're able to achieve much in the way of opportunity. Now, I, I remember the first time that I was confronted face to face with social capital, it was when I was a student at Yale Law School. And I found myself not knowing which job to apply to, what jobs were even out there, how one was supposed to get a professional letter of recommendation from a professor. And these things had tangible negative impacts on me. Now, it wasn't that I didn't have access to these economic opportunities. They were staring me at the face. I just didn't know what to do with them. It didn't mean that I was making bad individual choices. I just didn't know how to navigate that environment. No one from my family, no one even from my extended family, had ever been in a place like that. So it was a mentor who closed that social capital gap in my case. But if we want to understand this problem of poverty and low upward mobility in our, in our country, we've got to understand that that's happening too, that there are children who have opportunities, who aren't making bad individual decisions, but don't have the social networks that are necessary to support them to reveal the right decisions and to actually make it possible for those kids to follow that path once they've made those decisions. So in other words, what I'm trying to get at is that there are institutions that exist between individuals and governments. There are community organizations. There are Narcotics Anonymous organizations that are fighting the opioid crisis right now. There are churches and schools that are influential in how people are educated, not just in their hard skills, but in their soft skills and their value systems. There are families, families which are, in some cases, disintegrating for very complicated reasons. And if we're not talking about all of those things that exist in the middle, what Edmund Burke called the mediating institutions of society, then I don't think that we're going to really appreciate, one, what's going on in the lives of poor children, or two, how to actually fix this very significant problem we have, and I think this very unique problem that we have in this moment in time. So that's how I think about this problem, and I'll look forward to you guys telling me how wrong I am. Well, as we're going to wait for uh, JD to get situated, he'll get his microphone on and everything. But first, I want to turn to Director Dungy because I'm, I'm going to assume that maybe a good portion of people in this room have uh, perhaps read a book that JD has written. And, uh, and so you might know maybe some of the circumstances he had growing up. But Director, I wanted to give you an opportunity to tell us what, what your experience have, has been with, with uh, maybe the working poor or poverty and, and what, what you saw growing up sure. here in Columbus. Well, good afternoon, and thank you for having me here today. Um, it's truly my pleasure to sit next to J.D. He and I have had some conversations in the past about our childhood, and I'm happy to share sort of my perspective. Uh, first and foremost, what I do every day is not a job. It's actually my calling. I believe that I'm on assignment, and the reason why is because I believe that I was born to be a public servant. And I say that mainly because I was born in poverty, but thank God I never knew it. And the reason why is because my neighbors, my friends, my school, my church, everyone who was surrounded by me looked exactly like me. The households were the same, the incomes were the same, and in most instances, our, we were working poor, our families were the working poor, but we never knew that we were living below the poverty level. Because in that community, we had a lot of wealth. And the wealth was not money, the wealth was love, inspiration, and the knowledge that if, in fact, you worked hard, that it would pay off later. And so as I grew up, I clearly understood that while we didn't have a lot of material things, I understood that there was an expectation that was placed on me by my family. And we didn't have a lot of choices. 
There wasn't a choice to go to school or a choice to go to school. It was expected. There wasn't a discussion about it. And so I am happy now that I serve as the Director of Job and Family Services because at one point in my life, my family had to depend upon benefits. And they depend on it temporarily when my parents were unemployed. My mother was laid off sometimes when she worked for Lazarus. My dad was a grocer and he got laid off. And so we would have these periods in our life where we would have to rely on public assistance. But my family always said, we don't rely on government. We have to take care of ourselves. And we had a very, very strong work ethic. And so coming up, I understood that. The first time I realized there was something different about our household was when I had the opportunity to attend the Wellington School in Upper Arlington. The best experience I've ever had in my life. Um, but I was one of 32 in the first graduating class. And it was the first time when I walked in and I saw the school itself. There were things and resources in that school I'd never seen before. When I was finally, first time in my life, recognized as a minority. I'd never been a minority before in my life. My classmates looked just like me. I mean, certainly when you look at me, you see color, but I never knew there was something different about this because my entire environment looked exactly like me. And so it was interesting for me as a young person to go through that experience, but it also taught me a lot of life lessons. And Wellington was the bridge for me to continue to build upon to be where I am today. But as I look back as a director, I truly understand that those who are living in poverty have not made choices to live in poverty. That in many cases, there just hadn't been opportunities or individuals who worked with them to be mentors and to help them understand where we can all engage differently in that personal responsibility. So when I come to work every day as a public servant, I don't judge people for where they sit. I talk to them not about how they start their race, but how we can finish the race together. I'm more interested in understanding not where you came from, but where do you want to go? And how can we use our resources and our services to help you get there? Now to do that, it takes a lot of time and effort. And my dear friend who works for me now says it's not a sprint, it's a marathon. It takes time, it takes investment, it takes mentoring. And guess what? We're going to fail. There are going to be some families that we're not going to be able to assist. But in doing that, we're going to learn more about how we can be more helpful in move, helping move people up out of poverty. But I do believe that it takes personal engagement, and the entire community has to become engaged and be involved in this fight against poverty. And, and Director, the, the, a point I, I'm getting from your story is that while your family didn't have money, you had support, um, and you were maybe able to avoid distractions or t turmoil growing up that maybe, J.D., you did experience. And so. How do, you, how do you address distractions or problems that kids are facing at home when, when they really need to worry about going to school and getting an education, but there's something happening at home uh, that can prevent them from doing well in school? Well, it's, it's really tough, and we know the kids who grow up in very traumatic environments, either because there's abuse or, or, or drug use, that those kids are starting the race really with, with one, one hand tied behind their back. And, that, that's one of the things I worry about the most because it's, it's a tough problem to fix. Because very often the reason that they're growing up in an abusive or a very chaotic or traumatic household isn't because of anything they did, obviously. They're just kids. And it's in some cases not even because of something that the generation before them did. Sometimes this has been in these families for five, six, seven generations. And it has an unfortunate way of, of replicating itself. Um, there have been some interesting programs, you know, the Nurse Family Partnership, for example, I'm sure, Director, you're very aware of. There have been attempts to intervene in families and to actually go in and say, all right, you live in a very chaotic and traumatic environment. Unless you change something about that, your kids are going to grow up with an incredible disadvantage. How do we undo some of that multi-generational trauma that exists in your family? Um, that, that's an important thing, and I, I think those programs seem to be producing some pretty positive results. There was a really interesting study that folks did with the U.S. military, actually, where they took families that had been deployed multiple times and where the, 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 the husband or wife came back with a lot of PTSD issues, and they actually found that just going into these homes and actually saying, you know what, when you raise your, your voice to your kids like that, that actually makes your kid less likely to do well in school. That provides your kid with a pretty significant handicap. That was actually a pretty big and powerful motivator to change some of the way those, those families operated. But if you're going to do that, you've got to appreciate that family is really important, and you have to be willing to go into these families and actually have the conversation. And that's what I worry a little bit. I, I think that we're, we're not willing to actually accept the fact and confront the fact that some of the most significant disadvantages these kids face don't start when they're kindergartners at five years old. They start literally from the moment they were born. Director, how do, how, how do you, how does your department address these, these adverse situations that, that kids are growing up in? 
So at the department, we really strive for holistic case management. We know that each individual is connected to a family, and we have to stop just treating the individual and start looking at the entire circumstance. Um, what JD and I was talking about at lunch was that it's been interesting. So for those of us who have come from similar backgrounds, um, when you actually are starting to achieve success, first and foremost, making it okay to be successful is important. Mm -hmm. Number two is recognizing that once your family sees your success, you have to figure out sort of how do you still assist without overburdening yourself. So what we were sharing is about the number of family members that still call upon us to fix all their problems. Um, we both are blessed to be lawyers, and when we were in law school, we were sharing some of the stories about those that called us with a really quick question that took like four hours of research, and at the end, they want to know, then why are you in law school if you can't answer the question, right? So um, I mean, I think it's really important for us to realize that every individual is connected to that family, and we can't just solve it by moving just the individual and not treating that entire family, because if, in fact, the condition still exists, you're going to be connected, and you're going to want to do something about that. So we have a comprehensive case management program, and what we've done is we've said, for those individuals who are using our services, we really want to help to connect them to training and education that leads to a job. And not just any job, but a job that is in demand in Ohio, because we think that we understand from all the studies and research that the only way to solve poverty is through employment. And the way to get there is that we've got to get more of our young people infused into certification, training, and education programs. Um, how we do that um, is unique in that we have said that the, we will start to use our resources differently, that in order to receive benefits, we actually going to work with you to develop an employment plan. And that plan requires you to really talk about what are your skills, what are your goals, what are your dreams, and how do we then get you connected to the appropriate education and training resources to get you ready for employment. I want to I want to piggyback off of that the, the employment programs and and with the state offering help and government offering help. Is there a problem or is there a challenge in certain communities where where there's a lot of working poor where um, you have people who are kind of stubborn who don't want to admit that they have a problem and they don't want to accept any sort of help. Do you, do you face those challenges, JD? Did you see those challenges growing up where there was help out there, but people didn't want to accept taking that, taking that boost? Sure, I, I, I definitely saw that very briefly. I mean, you know, my, my grandma, who I lived with for, for much of my childhood, uh, really was resistant to taking even the help that she was entitled to, that she could have legally accessed. And there's certainly an element of, of pride to it. Some people just don't want to accept that they need that help. They don't want to accept uh, that, 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 that they need the government's support. Um, and, and I don't always think, you know, that, that's sometimes a, a destructive attitude, but it's also sometimes a helpful attitude, right, which is what makes this so difficult, is you don't want to totally defeat that sense of pride people have, because when they grow up in really tough circumstances, that pride is sometimes the thing that can really power them through their disadvantage and, and, and allow them to maintain some measure of employment or, or financial stability for themselves. Um, but at other times, it, it really is destructive, and I think that's especially true in the context of this drug problem that we have, where it's really, really hard to beat a drug addiction by yourself. If you're a grandparent and you're taking care of a couple of kids because your own kid can't take care of them, then sometimes you need to reach out and say, help me treat this kid, help me get this kid into treatment, because otherwise you're effectively swimming upstream and there's, just, there's, there's too much coming at you. I think in many communities, we've always been taught and trained that what happens in the home stays in the home. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so there was always a mistrust of government, that you don't go and share what's happening with your family, with these strangers who have the ability, number one, to remove a child, number two, to pass judgment and determine what benefits, and to basically determine that you're not capable of taking care of the children by yourself. And so that mistrust of government is a barrier that we always have to overcome so that we can actually now have access to those individuals who desperately need our services. And so what we're trying to do is make sure that we, we are rebranding, that we are truly jobs and family services. And so the goal is, is that when we come into contact with the individual, is to make sure that it's first understood that you're here probably because you have a crisis. And that's humbling. You have to walk through a door with all of your personal identifying information, your income statements, and all of the information about who's in your household. But we're going to help you to stabilize the crises, but then engage in this long-term planning. And I think that's the piece that we really have to focus on and making sure our communities understand that we are a resource, but we are always intended to be a temporary resource, not a long-term dependency. It is a temporary resource to assist you with then boosting yourself to a point that you can take care of yourself and become self-sufficient. How do, how do 
faith organizations play into that? Because I, I don't want to generalize, but I, I know people who, when they go through something, they say, my faith will help me, my church will help me. And, and admitting that something's wrong might, might admit that something's wrong in their faith somewhere. Do you ever uh, hit a wall when it comes to, to that kind of aspect? Um, I, I make no apologies for the fact that I'm a woman of faith. And so I spend a lot of time in churches. And the reason why I go there is because I see them much like our mission, which is that most people are going there because they know that they need the ability to network and to share and to fellowship. But in many cases, they're going to be on the front line whenever there's a crisis in a family. And I think it's really important for us to make sure that we are linking with our faith community because first and foremost, there are things that I cannot say as a government employee that faith leaders can say in terms of the circumstances and sort of how people got into the conditions that they're in. And so I am always one to use a pulpit for that message. Um, secondly, I think that there are many um, situations where churches and, and faith organizations have created their own programs. And in many cases, it could be a duplication. And if we were better coordinated and working well together, we could use our resources differently to help people in a different way. So rather than going to recreate and reinvent the same wheel, if, if we do our jobs of making sure that faith partners know about our programs and how to link and connect with us, then those additional dollars that the churches are actually raising, we could invest differently to make sure that we're making a difference holistically in the community. Yeah, when I was a kid, um, somebody in my family had significant car problems and just couldn't get to work anymore. They needed transportation to get to work. And it was actually the church that banded together, did a collection, and was able to buy them a car. Not a nice car, but a car that was able to get them to work. And just think about how incredibly powerful that is. I mean, one, you go from not having transportation to having transportation. But two, you know that people care about you. You know that you're not living on an island. You know that there's both moral support, but also, frankly, moral pressure that comes along with that gift of a car. And I, I think that that's something that we, we really have to appreciate and that I talked a little bit about my, my introductory remarks, is that people aren't just individuals. They're also members of families and members of communities. And any organization that provides that community can be really important and really powerful. I'm also a person of faith. And I think that churches are able to provide that community, frankly, better, better than, than peer institutions that I've seen because they have an organizing principle. They get people together. They have some financial resources. And I, and I think we, we've got to appreciate that those types of organizations are, are really powerful. I'd like to add one thing. Sure. Um, I'm going to date myself a little bit, but there was a horrible blizzard here in 1978, I believe. Um, some of you remember that time. <laughs> You're dating yourselves as well. Welcome, welcome. Right? <laughs> but what I recall was that none of us had power, which meant there was no food. We didn't have heat. And I can distinctly remember all the neighbors coming and knocking on the doors, and we went to live in the church. The churches gathered the community, and we went there. And let's be clear, school was still an expectation. So there were enough teachers in the, in the church as well that we still had classes, we were fed, we were clothed, and of course we still had to go to choir rehearsal and Bible study. Now, <laughs> but back then, if you really think about that, when the communities had issues, the churches were really our foundations in the communities and we were able to get together and bring people together. And it seems like somewhere we've lost that. Um, and, and I'd really like to understand a little bit more about how we can better engage our faith partners because there used to be a time when we looked at community solutions versus always turning to government. And clearly we have a role to play, but the role has to be one that is shared responsibility for the individuals, the communities, as well as government. You know, one of the most startling pieces of data that I stumbled upon when I was doing research for the book is that, is that active church participation, meaning you know, weekly or semi-weekly church attendance, actually is now more common among middle and upper income people than it is among lower income people. That's effectively reserve, reversed in about a generation. So you think about the stereotype that we have of sort of all the poor people going to church, the Bible Belt, the dumb and uneducated and so forth. It's actually almost exactly the reverse. It's middle class and wealthier people who are going to church these days and lower income people have really dropped out of it. And that really worries me given that the church does play that really positive role in some of these communities. Well, you, both of you have talked about how poverty, the challenges of poverty can take on all sorts of faces. It, because it's such a, a big problem, where do you even begin? How, is, is there one aspect that seems like we start here and then the chips will fall? Yeah, I mean, I mean, if I had to pick one single 
significant driver. It, it's probably that, that I, I think of poverty very much as a sort of network effect, as, as for lack of a better word, as, as sort of a, of a cloud problem. And so if there's one thing that you can really do, if there's one way, one difference you could make, it would be to sort of break up some of the networks of poverty that become self-perpetuating. And I think that's true either if you're talking about in the inner cities or if you're talking about very rural parts of the country where you have poor people, definitely, but where they live on an island basically by themselves. And, and I, I think that's something else that, that, again, has changed in the past 30 or 40 years, is that we didn't have quite the same concentrated effects of just poor people living among only other poor people. And I, and I think that, that primarily, frankly, is, is a problem of housing policy. In some cases, of actively destructive housing policy, where you take certain communities and force them into certain neighborhoods. But in some cases, just making housing actually not affordable because of building restrictions and so forth. And what it ends up having the effect of is telling poor people, you're going to live in an island by yourself only with other poor people. And I think if you can break up that island a little bit and get some you know, poor folks living with middle income folks folks start to, to spread some of the problems out a little bit and create a more solid social foundation. I, I think that is, is, is the one thing that I would do to maybe make a big difference or make a big impact in, in poverty. At the department, we're really focused on the creation of jobs and making sure that we have a workforce that is ready to go to work. And I think that you, you create that workforce in many different ways, but we focus first on a population of young people that we think we have a shot at, at least putting a break in that generational cycle. And so we're focused first on ages 16 to 24. And the reason why is because after looking at what was happening across the country, we found four factors that were more likely than not to lead to poverty. And they're very simple. Dropping out of high school, having a child before the age of 21, drug and alcohol addiction, and not having a job. Now, those four factors are easy for me to talk about. They're not easy to solve, but we have taken that backdrop and said, if we were able to make an impact looking at our data and who we serve at the department, where could we make the best investment of our resources? And we're thinking that age 16 to 24 was the best place to start. And the reason being is because that's exactly when we start to see young people making some of those decisions that have led them to now create that generational cycle. So we're really focused on making sure that we break those barriers and then connect those, pe those young people um, to employment, training, and education. And I think the, the big thing is to recognize that there are different paths. Each of us were uniquely made. We have different paths. And a four-year institution may not be for everyone. Mm -hmm. There are many career paths. We can start teaching trades have apprenticeship programs, talk about education and certification programs versus two or four institutions. Not to say, because I don't want anyone telling me that my child's not good enough to go to college, not to say that at all, but to say that if my child is uniquely and divinely gifted to do something with his hands and he's mechanically inclined, perhaps he may be better in a certification program and he can go make a really good living um, in, in, that, in that field and to not turn our nose at the fact that he's not going to college. And so I think that we're starting to create those images now that there are many pathways to success. JD, you mentioned uh, when you when you were speaking earlier about the political dialogue that that we hear, where the right saying one thing, the left saying the other, but there's really all this stuff in between. Uh, do you see a problem with politics getting in the way of policy making, where people want to win the political argument, so nobody's actually getting in there and, and fixing problems? Yes. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I figured that. <laughs> that was the softball of the day. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, I I, 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 was, I, I was talking about this earlier today, actually. So, so I, I, I was in, um, I was in Portsmouth, Ohio, not long ago, and, and was talking to some folks who are really frontline warriors in the opioid epidemic, and primarily a, a bunch of um, pr primarily Democrats, some Republicans, but. You know, pr primarily a Democratic audience, and it, it was crazy how when the conversation really got started, all of these sort of ideological differences that you're used to hearing kind of melted away. You heard people talk about the lack of job opportunities. You heard people talk about personal responsibility. You heard people talk about the fact that families are breaking apart. 
And it was just amazing to recognize the fact that when you actually get on the ground of the people who are really involved in implementing and talking about policy day to day, whether they're Democrats or Republicans, they actually have relatively similar views because when you spend your day dealing with the problems, you can't help but to come to some of the similar conclusions, which to put it simply, this problem's really complicated, right? It's about housing and jobs and family breakdown and, and all of these things working together. And so I, I really think that we're not well served, to, to, to put it bluntly, uh, by, by, the, uh, by the political conversation. And frankly, when I, when I hear these people talk, and I, I mean when I hear politicians talk, I very often think, how much time do you really spend on the ground with people who are trying to solve these problems? Because I bet if they spent more time, they wouldn't sound like they did. But it does seem to work, and how do you... <laughs> And, and, and as challenging as that is, it does seem the work, though, the, the politicians who say this or that still end up getting elected. How do you break through the, the, <laughs> the how do you break through the, the, the problem? So, so I, I, I think of, uh, my wife is from Gallipolis, Ohio, in Gallia County. And, and I think of the problems that I hear from, from them. And, and they have so much... Let's, let's talk about Obamacare. They have so much distaste for Obamacare, but then when you ask around, you find out a lot of their friends or they, they themselves are benefiting from it. How do you break through that, that dialogue? And director, I, I, you see it all the time, the governor's out there about Medicaid expansion a lot. So. I think, um, first and foremost, I think that sometimes it's easier to look at things through your own filter when it doesn't touch you personally. And I think that as we begin to engage and share more personal stories about how individuals um, are living daily, because those of us on the front line, we see this all day long. Um, quite frankly, our federal oversight agencies are completely out of touch with what's happening on the ground. Um, and we've got to start having real conversations. We have to stop pretending like our communities are perfect communities. And we have to actually sometimes tell stories that may not be the ones that make us look so great. Because until we start to accept our reality, it's hard to work on it. And I think that what we have to do is to begin to get some of those politicians and hold them accountable. We elect them, for God's sake. Um, so we're responsible for holding them accountable for the work that they're doing on behalf of our communities. Um, when I think about health care, um, I think about the fact that I grew up as a child with tuberculosis without health care. My parents went to a free clinic. It had it not been for a physician who volunteered her services, I probably wouldn't be here today. And I cannot imagine families who have to make decisions every day about how to acquire medication, how to actually have access to good medical services, and what it would mean if folks didn't have coverage. And so the conversation has to be more about what role does government actually play in this conversation, but more importantly, what is the impact on our communities? You know, behind every single decision that I make as a director or anyone else makes as an elected official, there are people. There are real lives. We've got to stop pretending like these words on a piece of paper are magic. We are actually impacting the lives of individuals every single day we make those decisions, and we have to hold folks accountable for it. Yeah, I, I, I'm sort of a, you know, on the, the political pro process, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty optimistic over the long term because, you know, yeah, it's right that people bicker at each other and that these problems don't seem to get solved. But I think that's true if you take a really short-term view of the problem. But eventually, people face the consequences. They vote out the folks who aren't doing a good job. And I, I think eventually this problem starts to fix itself. That's what's good about democracy, as Winston Churchill once said, it's, it's the worst governmental system except for all the rest. So it takes us some time to come to our senses, but eventually we do come to our senses. And I think that the, the thing on this healthcare, uh, this healthcare mess in, in DC, and I, and I say this as, as a Republican who cares a lot about health care policy, I think what we learn, and I mean my party learned, is that it's really easy to run against something, but you've got to actually have a positive vision for what you do. And I think that a lot of folks who spent the past seven years criticizing all of the unpopular parts of health reform and got elected doing so found themselves in D.C. with majorities and thought, oh, what do we do now? <laughs> and, I, and I think that's, that's sort of what has driven a lot of the, the gridlock that we've seen over health reform in the past few weeks, is you had a lot of folks who really just were never forced to think, how do we actually solve this problem? And my hope is that now they're, that they're forced to think about it. Um, you know, maybe it doesn't get solved immediately, but eventually we start to figure this stuff out. All right. Well, we're going to soon move to audience questions. So if you do have a question, feel free to make your way over to that microphone. So. Uh, but as you do that, I see people popping up. Good. Um, as you do that, let's, I'll, I'll leave you with one final thought. Um, 
Uh, JD, you said that the thing you'd like to see most change with the white working class is the feeling that their choices don't matter. Yep. How, how do you go about doing that? How do you go about changing that? I think, first of all, you've got to get people to see that there are pathways beyond the one that they've, they've sold to themselves, that there are opportunities out there, that maybe they don't want to go to a four-year university, but there is a vocational program or there is an apprenticeship program. There is a pathway to the middle class. And I think that's where a lot of that hopelessness and that despair comes from, is they look at their future. If you're an 18-year-old kid who graduates from high school, none of your, no one in your family has ever gone to college, and you're basically given a choice between flipping burgers or going to a four your university far away from your home and family, it's not surprising actually that people were pretty hopeless. So I think we've got to figure out more pathways for people because it's bad to not have those opportunities. It's really bad to layer on top of it that sense of hopelessness and giving up on yourself. And that's what you see in a lot of really struggling communities, a lack of opportunity and despair layered on top of it. And you know, it, it's like, it's really bad to be dealt a crappy hand, but when you don't even try to play it well, that's the worst of all circumstances. And I think that's, that's the situation that unfortunately a lot of communities find themselves in right now. Oh, I, 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 sorry, Angie's going to be mad at me if I don't give this spiel. It's CMC's tradition to take questions. Uh, please state your name. Please state your name, ask your question, and in consideration of everyone, please stick to questions rather than editorial comments. Hi, thanks. Uh, my name is Jane Boyer, and I was born and raised in Scioto County. So for those people who really don't understand this island of poverty that you were talking about, I encourage a broader reading, and I encourage people to look at Joshua Wilkie's reading list that, of course, Mr. Vant, you're on the top of that list. You can find it on the Appalachia Life blog. And, um, so, but my, my concern is that writings from the humanities, such as memoirs and anecdotes, those kinds of things become conflated with social science so that people who are not actually familiar with the island of poverty think that what they've learned from a memoir is okay to use to form social science policies. Does that concern you at all and could you address that? Well, it, it definitely concerns me. Um, the, the one thing I'll say is that even very, very good and very rigorous social science is misinterpreted and misapplied. And so what I try to do with the book, um, at least you know my memoir, is not put anything in there that wasn't rooted in some other piece of evidence so that if people extrapolated from it, they wouldn't extrapolate to the, to the wrong place. So when I talk about the importance of social capital or the importance of stable families, when I, when I talk about the real havoc that the opioid epidemic has, re, you know, has had on some of these communities, when I talk about the decline in church participation and attendance, um, what, what I did is try to root that in some really rigorous evidence that was also out there. Uh, and that's how I personally, as a memoir writer, tried to avoid the particular problem that you're talking about. Um, but, but I, I you know, I, I'm, I'm become you know somewhat close with this uh, this economist at Stanford, Raj Chetty, who I think is doing the very best work on why we don't have a lot of upward mobility in the United States. And people misapply his research and his findings. So I, I think in, at some level, you've got to just leave it to the reader and hope that most people will interpret it only as far as it should go. And obviously, that's not going to be true all the time. I'm Carol Looper. Your memoir has served for many, I would think, as an inspiration, somebody who came from deep poverty and has great success. How has your success impacted your family? Uh, well, they have a lot of reporters coming to town and wanting to ask them questions. <laughs> that's, that's, that's one way it's affected them. You know, I, I mean, I, I don't think there's, there's an especially easy answer to this question. I mean, obviously, the success of the book has been great. It hasn't radically altered the circumstances of my family. Um, you know, they, they, like I said, they get asked questions by reporters, but, but, but that's about it. I mean, I, I think that sort of the success unrelated to the book, something that the secretary or the, the director and I were talking about earlier, is, is that, you know, when you live an upwardly mobile life, you are necessarily brought into contact with a lot of people and institutions and even cultural values that are very alien to the people that you came from. And I think the way that my success has most impacted my family is that in some cases, 
some people in my family feel like maybe they, they lost somebody, that they went off to some highfalutin university, they changed their attitude, they changed the job that they have, and now all of a sudden we've, we've sort of lost that kid. And I try to fight that as much as I can. I try not to let myself become distant and separated uh, because it is true that we are living increasingly in two separate worlds. And I think that those of us who are lucky enough to have had the life that I've had have a certain responsibility to not completely forsake the people that we came from. And that's what I, I've, I've tried to do, certainly in writing the book, but more importantly, just in the way that I, I live my life and try to interact with my family. I'm, I'm curious what you think about that, actually, because it, it's a different world. It is a different world, and we were having this conversation earlier today, and I, I think that one of the things that's been most challenging is that sometimes your family looks to you um, as the answer and the solution to all the issues and problems because you did make it. Um, and so there is, a, there is a different amount of responsibility that you shoulder as, as the child who has risen from poverty to where you are, and, and let's, we both work. I mean, we are, we are still working and working at doing whatever it is that our purpose is for us to do, but for those who, who look at us, they see our success sometimes as a way for them to get there. But at the same time, we're ostracized. And so as I began to think about my climb and going to Wellington, I was talking funny, I was walking funny, I was dressing funny. I'm on the east side of Columbus, Ohio, with a little plaid skirt and an Argyle shirt. I mean, that is not acceptable <laughs> riding a Coda bus to school every day. Um, and so there is this separation that happens as you are trying to do better because the community is not ready to accept your success and you're teased and you're called a nerd and you're, you're called all these things because they're trying to disassociate you and the whole time we're fighting to stay connected. Mm -hmm. And so I think there is a, there's a different amount of responsibility for both J, JD and I and our families as it relates to that. Hello, Renee Delane from Women Who Dare. Um, first of all, where are the men asking questions? <laughs> anyway, you don't have to answer that. Um, I just... <laughs> I just I have this effect on women, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> Granted, okay, <laughs> point taken. I have a question about why you think the populations of of people in churches have flipped over that fifty year period to the middle class and those are wealthy. If you could give some explanation about why that happened and what can we do to to make some changes to make it more uh, democratized? Yeah, my, my very brief answer to this question is, is that I think that um, a, a lot of churches have, one, geographically relocated. So if you, if you look at where churches are these days, very often they're in middle class neighborhoods. They're not in, in sort of you know, lower class neighborhoods. There used to be a church on every corner in a lot of poor neighborhoods. There, there isn't anymore. So I, I do think there's sort of a geographic separation problem. Uh, but I also think in some ways, uh, the, the message of the church has become tailored to the people that they're around. So it's directed at middle class Americans and a lot of, a lot of lower class Americans sometimes can feel left out or left behind by a particular message. So I, I've tried to tell a lot of the, the churches and religious leaders that I've talked to that you know, in some cases we should be thinking about these communities in our own backyard the same way that we think about mission work in Guatemala or in a country across the ocean because these communities are struggling just as intensively and they really do need, I think, a lot of the things that the church can provide. Okay, hi, um, my name's Kathy Kerr and I'm executive director of CASA of Franklin County. And um, for those of you that don't know, CASA, um, we train community volunteers to work on behalf of abused and neglected children in court. They're their guardian ad litem. And JD, I met you briefly when you spoke to our CASA national convention in Seattle in March, you know, I and I learned yeah. <laughs> that you interned at yep. CASA of Franklin County when you went to OSU. And so I, whenever I see you on TV or talking anywhere, I, I feel like a proud mama bear for some reason. <laughs> I don't know the connection, but I tell whoever I'm with, yeah, he, uh, he interned at CASA. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> so, but we are so proud of you and so excited. But Thank what you. my question is, um, did you find that your experience at a younger age when you were at OSU and you interned at Casa Franklin County, did that really impact you and did, did that um, contribute to some of your thoughts and maybe theories that went into your book? Yeah, it, it, it certainly did. And obviously it was in, in, influenced by a lot of what I saw growing up. 
but it, it was, uh, you know, it, how can it not be formative to see some of these things, not as a kid experiencing them yourself, but as, you know, an adult watching other kids experiencing some of the same things. And I, and I do think, you know, one of the real takeaways from my time at, at CASA and just seeing some of the cases that people worked on is that it's really, really hard, and I think harder than it should be, to get kids who come from traumatic homes into a stable situation. Uh, the legal system, I, I understand it's gotten a little bit easier, but it certainly isn't as easy as it should be. And it was really astonishing to see how many parents or families really wanted to take care of a kid and how many kids desperately wanted to get into a good home, but there was just this massive bridge to cross that the legal system really didn't help sometimes. So that, that was definitely one of the takeaways that, that, I, that, that I, I had from, from my time at CASA. And it's, it's tough, and it's one of the problems that I think that public policy could really make a big difference on. Hi, uh, I'm Sophie Smith Campbell and I'm a high school student at the Arts and College Preparatory Academy. And I grew up in Vinton County, Ohio. And if you know where that is, it's super sure. Southern. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and my question is sort of how can I help my friends and my family who are still in Vinton County uh, to like help them out of their situations and like what can I personally do? Can we take that one? <laughs> <laughs> All right, I'll, okay, I, I can start. Um, so I, I think the most important thing that you can do is actually to just stay connected. There's gonna be a tendency and I think a temptation for you the further you get away from where you came from when you go to college, when you have a lot of opportunities, to, to really sort of separate yourself from that world and to see yourself more as an observer as opposed to an actual participant. And what those communities need most of all is people with talent and resources and energy who are part of the community. Now, does that mean you need to move back home as soon as you graduate from college? No, but I do hope it means you'll stay connected, that you'll think about these people as actual people, not as sort of statistics in a social science paper or as observables to influence your worldview, to, to really continue to stay attached to the community that you came from. I, I, you know, what you can do to help them specifically, it's gonna be person to person, but I would say that the, the thing I've seen in, in helping and in dealing with a lot of my friends and family back home is it's easy to forget just how many of the options that are out there aren't even on people's radar. Not because they're not possible, but just because people are ignorant that they even exist. And I, 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 and, I, and I think that being cognizant of sort of, you could do this thing, you could go and apply for this thing, here's this job that you might be able to get, just being aware of what's actually out there because a lot of people have very focused radar screens and broadening that horizon a little bit can actually expose them to a lot of issues and a lot of opportunities that they would otherwise uh, be, be, be cut off from. I think I'd like to add to that, that I think it's important for you just to be who you are and to share your story. I think one of the most effective things that we have is our story. And when someone comes into my office and they share a story that's similar to mine, there's an immediate connection. No one wants to be proselytized to by someone they think they're sitting on a high pole someplace else. But when I know that you've walked the walk and you've lived it, see, I don't just talk about poverty, I lived it. This is my story. It's not everyone else's story, this was my experience. But your story and your circumstances is what's gonna reach the people that you grew up with. It's gonna reach those neighbors because they know where you came from. And when someone can see you and they can actually see what you've gone through and know that there is that opportunity and that hope exists, you are the success story that they need and so only you can tell your story, so keep it. Are they still receptive to that? I mean, I, I'm wondering if when people do make it out of poverty, go to better schools, gain, gain an education, uh, are you ever treated as outsiders in your own communities where you grew up? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, so absolutely you're treated as outsiders in your own community, but I think if you stay connected, mm -hmm. there's always a way to reconnect. Yeah. And I think that that's why it's important to go back. And that's why it's important to actually share the story. I think one of the most offensive things that people say sometimes is, forget where you came from. If you get, forget where you came from, you have no idea where you're going. And so I always share where I came from. And I think that um, you always have a window of an opportunity to reach someone. And I think that doing so um, means to them that there is just that hope that I, can, I too can have a different path. 
Yeah, you're, you're always going to have the people in your community who say you've become too big for your britches and it's always going to be hard to reach everybody. But look, I mean, I, I think that one of the things I've learned is that there are a lot of people who just want to stay connected to you and who can really benefit from that connection. So I'd, I'd encourage you to, to, to do that as much as possible. And like the director said, telling your story is, is very powerful. Powerful not just for the community you came from, but powerful for audiences like this to hear too. Hi, my name is John Mackay, and I'm with PATH, and we're a company that helps businesses uh, create great customer and employee experiences. And I know that sounds irrelevant, but one of the things I find interesting in this conversation, we talk about government, we talk about community institutions, we talk about family. What role does for-profit institutions have? And you know, you talk about jobs being one of the key indicators. What obligation, if any, do they have to participate proactively in, you know, in this conversation? In order for me to build a vision that others are going to participate in training or education, I have to have a partnership with for-profits and with business. Because if I take someone through an entire training program and there's nothing for them to go to, I've just added more burden and more hopelessness. And so I think that there is an opportunity for all of us to think about, are there entry-level positions that we need to take a look at that we could offer to make sure that individuals have a pathway into work and into employment. Um, I constantly challenge employers to take a look at their minimum criteria and their minimum qualifications. You know, what is it about this particular job and this skill set that is needed? The partnership that we have to have is that I've got a pipeline. I've got a pipeline of individuals that are receiving public assistance who need employment, and you have jobs. And so I think that's a supply and demand. That's an equation that we can solve together. But it's about having that conversation and making sure that when I do deliver an employee, that that employee is work ready and that you're actually getting what you need out of that individual. Yeah, I, I think the one of the things we, we miss sometimes when we talk about jobs training and retraining and education, community colleges, apprenticeship programs, and so forth, is that the experiences we've had so far suggest that the best retraining programs are those where there are partnerships with businesses. Because businesses know what they need, employers know what they need better than community colleges in some cases. So you know the classic model, and a model that unfortunately doesn't work that, that well when you look at the data, is that a community college set of administrators sit around in a room with Bureau of Labor Statistics data, try to say what jobs are gonna exist five years from now and how do we train our people for those jobs that are gonna exist five years from now. What's much more powerful is that community college working with employers in the private sector and saying what jobs do you need Let's figure out how to get people trained for them. And I think that's, that's a real leadership role that the private sector could play. I have one more question before uh, Kermit comes up, because I wouldn't be a good reporter if I asked this. Uh, Director Dungey, JD, you, you both brought up a lot of interesting points, good ideas. Uh, are either of you going to run for political office someday? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we'd like to announce our candidacy yeah. again. Yes. <laughs> Same ticket. <laughs> I think we're a great team. <laughs> I think we're out of time. <laughs> you first. Uh, I'm not answering that question. <laughs> yeah, no, I'll, I'll give the answer I, I've always given. I, I, look, I, I think public service is, is meaningful and valuable, uh, but I think there are other ways to contribute, and that's what I'm, I'm most interested in doing right now. For me, um, I think I stated earlier, I truly am a public servant. I believe I was called to the job that I'm at now. And when this season is over, I'll see what God has for me. Thank you. Well, I hope you enjoyed today's forum. I know I did. Uh, We encourage you to continue the conversation with Coffee and Cookies and let you know that you can view and share today's forum and all of our forums on CTV Columbus Television on WOSU and PBS affiliates statewide through the Ohio Channel and anytime on CMC's website via YouTube. Let's thank all of our sponsors, the Columbus Foundation, and please hold your, I got a long list to go through here, so please hold your, your applause. Let's thank all of our sponsors, the Columbus Foundation, Fordham Institute, Deloitte, Porter Wright, Dispatch Media Group, the Jeffrey Company, and partner Columbus Metropolitan Library. And of course, our speakers, J.D. Vance, Cynthia Dungy, and Andy Chow. And thanks to all of you for being here. We look forward to seeing you next week at CMC.